Right, tonight, we're gonna to talk about solar storms. And the thing that is so wacky about these things, first of all, this is a, as we all recognize, a coronal mass ejection. Sun burps out a huge cloud of plasma. But look at this stuff. Uh, this is stuff that hit the, uh, the imaging sensor on the SOHO satellite, which is located about a million miles from the Earth. So these coronal mass ejections, they launch high energy particles into space, among other things. Those particles wind up in our electronics, they produce noise and all kinds of things. And in large enough numbers, and with the right strategic drop, uh, they can basically knock out a satellite or cause satellite upsets, which is kind of a bad thing. Um, here's another view, a mathematical view, of what one of these things, oh, all right, well, we can do that too. Uh, after it arrives at Earth, uh, it does very wonky things with Earth's magnetic field uh, out at uh, sort of midnight, uh, which is the tail of the Earth's magnetic field causes it to sort of release energy, accelerate particles, those particles rain into the polar regions, and you get the lovely aurora that we see. Okay, so that's the second thing. And here are the aurora that we all feel and awe about on the ground. And, and here's the real problem. You know, we know that the sun is doing these really horrific things in, in the distance. Um, magnetic field rec reconnection releases energy, which accelerates particles, Particles arrive at the Earth, upset the Earth's magnetic field in a variety of interesting ways. But the end result of all of that violence, as far as you and I are concerned, is this. Isn't that beautiful? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, and that's why it's so hard to tell this story and get really anybody excited about it. Because you can give them the most horrific solar event seen by NASA satellites, and in the end, ooh. <laughs> and to me as an astronomer, I think, oh my god, I have a lot of work to do with this community. <laughs> uh, the space weather kind of looks like this. This is a, a spaghetti diagram of the things that can happen. Uh, on a bad, bad hair day, uh, you have the solar wind and corolla the holes, you have cosmic rays, and then these things produce magnetic storms on the Earth and satellite and on on a really uh, typical day where you have a solar storm, you get all of these kinds of things. So the sun can do a lot of interesting things, either sort of on a constant basis or on sort of this very episodic and very dramatic basis, which uh, we all like to follow. Um, for the most part, uh, we see aurora, which is really quite lovely. And, and this is sort of what they really look like. These are photos of aurora. But if you go back in time and, and try to figure out how people reacted to these very same kind of phenomena, you get this kind of interesting, weird story in, in, in history. Um, 1561, here is a woodcut of what they thought an aurora looked like. Like, what? <laughs> Does that look anything like what I just showed you in the actual pictures? But this is how they sort of viewed what was going on. Kind of a little bit dreadful, you know, these tongues of fire descending from the skies. I mean, jeeps, jeepers. And here, here's this. I mean, what in the world? I mean, are we talking about hallucinogens or what? You know, they're trying to sort of draw what they're seeing, and we see what they're seeing, but what they're drawing is obviously biased by some pre-existing idea of what they have that's going on up there, which generally looks pretty dreadful. Uh, here, candles in the air. <laughs> Any of those aurora curtains that I showed you look like candles in the air? But no, this is how they interpreted lights in the sky at night. And the only lights they knew about were candles. So they put the candles in the sky. Makes sense. Um, here are some sketches as late as 1700s. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of realism here, finally, after you know all these, these centuries. But still, sort of primitive. And, and these are in sort of uh, northern uh, Europe. So when they do get storms, really big auroral events there, you know, they, they get them from time to time, but maybe <coughs> once every, you know, 40 or 50 years, you'll get a really big storm that people in Northern Europe can see. At least that's the recent statistics. 
There is a sort of curly Q corkscrew kind of things going on. Um, 1726, we have someone trying to render what they said was basically uh, an aurora, a, a coronal aurora. Uh, basically, if you look up at certain types of auroral features, it looks like there's a spreading center and they're spreading from, emerging from, it's like a meteor shower. It's like they're coming from a central point. We call this a coronal event. And so this is not a bad rendition of what that looks like. So we're getting much more realism by the mid early 1700s. Finally, 1839, we finally have some artists wading into this subject <laughs> who actually have an eye for nature. And we're starting to get some actually quite lovely looking drawings uh, and watercolors of, of Aurora. Um, 1868, this is a, a woodcut. Doesn't look too bad. This is from uh, uh, basically, this is the Aurora Borealis, so that's in the Northern Hemisphere. Published in the New York, New York Times, 1868, not bad. Uh, here we have a, a French artist uh, representing shooting rays, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in terms of rendering the sun, we have a whole other set of, of issues. How do you render what's, what the sun looks like when you can't really look at it for very long? There's the problem. Uh, here we have an interesting thing. Uh, one of the earliest, well, here's a drawing of, a, uh, of an aurora, 1836. Uh, this is sort of pre-photographic. So they wait for a total solar eclipse, and they look at the corona. Now, the corona during totality had been known for a number of centuries. But finally, somebody decided to actually draw the darn thing. You know, not bad. But it's very curious that this kind of a picture is not thematically different than one that was used back in the, uh, the 14th century BC by Akhenaten when he was drawing the, the rays of the sun from the disk Aten. And that was the beginning of monotheism in Egypt, which lasted basically about 40 years. <laughs> uh, oh well, so much for monotheism. Uh, but it's the same kind of an idea. And if you look at the history of Egypt and total solar eclipses, you discover that, yep, there were quite a fair number of total solar eclipses whose track went across the Nile in the northern parts, the middle parts, and the southern. So clearly Egyptians knew about totality, and they knew about the corona, because they could see it just like you and I do. Uh, why it is that they saw total solar eclipses, but then didn't write impassioned discussions about them, because the sun was the sun god. And what happens when the sun god goes away at noon? I mean, isn't that a little bit unnerving? But you don't have any papyrus documents or inscriptions that say anything about that. It's like the Egyptians just, yeah, okay, it's fine, it happens. All right. <laughs> well, anyway, so we're in the 1800s and people are starting to draw really good renditions of the solar corona, 1851. Here's the first photograph, 1851. Yeah, it kind of looks kind of mushy. Uh, 1858. Uh, you know, here we have, uh, you know, helmet streamers and uh, a variety of things like that you can identify. Uh, here, 1860, it's purported that this is the first drawing of a coronal mass ejection seen during a total solar eclipse. Well, the jury is sort of out to lunch on that. Not that the jury itself is out to lunch, but, you know, it's, uh, it might be, it might not be, we don't know. But, you know, it looks like there's stuff coming off of the sun in a kind of a dynamic way. So, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, here we 1878. Um, so, during the 1800s, you know, people drew totality and the corona, you know, pretty accurately. So, they were sort of getting along really well. Uh, sunspots were another element of space weather that uh, took a long time to get straight. Uh, the Chronicles of John of Worcester in 1128 AD. Uh, this is a drawing in some miraculous way of sunspots on the sun. And if you can correlate that with anything that you've ever seen through a filter, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> but that's, this is identified as the earliest sketch of sunspots on the sun uh, by historians of science. Uh, 
Uh, we get to Galileo and we have uh, a better telescope, uh, uh, stronger retinas. <laughs> He probably just projected it onto a white card because that's how a normal person would, would do it. Uh, and then you sketch what you see. And so these sketches now begin to look really neat. And over a sequence of time, uh, he did uh, sketches of the sun. And you can actually see these sunspots move as the sun rotates. So he had a sense, wow, these things are moving. And maybe the sun is rotating and carrying them along. So that was sort of the discovery of the rotating sun, um, which is really cool. Uh, then in 1785, we have uh, much better telescopes uh, and astronomers uh, with uh, a bit more flair for artistry, and they were able to do even better with uh, rendering the umbra and the penumbra uh, accurately, uh, plus the, uh, the uh, penumbral filaments. Here you see those as well, as these little lines coming out. Uh, Richard Carrington in 1859, uh, he was a a, a very wealthy, uh, his, his dad ran the, uh, the beer business in his town. Uh, and uh, basically Richard was uh, an astronomer trained at uh, Cambridge. Uh, and so as, I guess, a graduation present, <laughs> his, his dad bought him an entire observatory. <laughs> Man, I, you know, one of the, one of the biggest in, in England at the time. Uh, but little did he know uh, that there was a guy three towns over who was independently wealthy uh, by having invented barbed wire. <laughs> uh, and he had built a telescope twice as big as Richard's. Uh, and on the day when, uh, September 2nd, 1859, when poor Richard Carrington saw this wonderful optical solar flare for the first time, lasted five minutes, he didn't get to share that in the history books. No, he had to share it with that amateur astronomer with the barbed wire and the larger telescope, you know, it, 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 it kind of sucks to be a, an astronomer sometimes. You know, you don't often get the credit you deserve. But anyway, um, 1871, we have uh, Langley uh, doing sketches of sunspots. They're getting better and better. And Miller in 1890. Um, 1843, we discovered, uh, Schwab discovers the sunspot cycle. Uh, this is sort of the current state of the situation today. Uh, we're in cycle 24. Uh, sort of past the peak at this time. Um, and now, so we have the solar corona, we have basically sunspots, uh, we have aurora. Uh, we have a lot of the ingredients for space weather from sort of cradle to grave, but now what we need in order to make it an interesting story is people. Uh, we need people getting really massively screwed up one way or another. Now. I'm going to only give you one punchline from the book. There is no documented evidence that anyone has ever died from a solar storm. The military might have all kinds of secret files, you know, warfare, when shortwave didn't go through during battles, but there are no public sources that identify a single person having died from a space weather event. And there is the problem for legions of us who are trying to get the public interested in space weather. If nobody dies from a natural phenomenon, do you really care? <laughs> You've got a thunderstorm that can wipe out you know, people by the hundreds every year. You've got tornadoes. You've got hurricanes, tsunamis, tidal waves. These things take out substantial numbers of people, earthquakes. Makes for really good reading, very exciting, very passionate, very sad, traumatic. You do not get the same story with space weather. Space weather is sanitized by the aurora. Uh, the only ways in which you really are affected by space weather is through radio communications or satellites sometimes, occasionally power grid lapses. Rare events that you can basically recover from and grouse about, but life goes on. You know, pagers go out. You know, they went out in 1998 from a satellite that was whacked by a space weather event. But you never heard in the papers about, you know, a surgeon that was not called at the right time for, you know, his surgery to take place and the patient died. You don't hear. If there were stories like that, the media would be reporting because media loves to report things going really bad. 
and what a wonderful story this would be. But there simply is no evidence that that's ever happened. So, we are left with talking about a whole other set of ways in which we can be inconvenienced, which don't involve our death, which I guess has a kind of a good side to it. Um, and the first thing that we need is we need a transducer. Okay, we've got these solar storms rattling the Earth's magnetic field, we've got X-ray flares heating up the upper atmosphere and messing up the ionosphere. But until you can get down to the human scale and human operations, these are just basically astrophysical theories as far as you're concerned. You need some kind of transducer that communicates the storm <coughs> into your life. And technology is that transducer. Since we started with telegraphy and currently we have satellites, every single one of those technologies has been a transducer for space weather events, which has led to outages, inconveniences, breaks in information, communication mishaps, satellite, expensive satellites not working, you know, things like that. So, we have these, a variety of different transducers. The simplest actual one is a magnetic compass. When we have a magnetic storm, uh, the Earth's magnetic field at the surface wiggles around quite a lot during the storm event. And that causes compass needles to measurably move around. Uh, now, we know that magnetic compasses were used you know, during the 17th and 18th century by navigators to get around the world, you know, to get to safe harbor and a port. Now imagine a situation where, you know, you're navigating your way into a port, you know, in a typically narrow channel, which hasn't been, you know, cleared out because they didn't have that technology. Uh, and it's a fog. And all you have is your magnetic compass. And suppose you've got a storm going on at the same time. You know, fractions of a degree make a big deal under those kinds of <coughs> high demand positional, you know, measuring and, and navigation situations. It sounds like a match made in heaven, but where are all the shipwrecks? <laughs> there are no historical examples of mariners claiming that at the time you know, they ran aground that there was a brilliant aurora going on above their heads, because that would be the dead giveaway that there is a really intense magnetic storm. Oh well, so, as an astronomer, you can't write that story because there's no evidence. You can just say, well, plausibly this could happen, and then everybody goes to sleep because nobody wants to read about plausibilities. I don't know. Okay, now we get a bit more interesting. Uh, magnetic storms, they wiggle the Earth's magnetic field. And I think one or two of you might remember from your undergraduate course in electro electrodynamics that whenever you wiggle a magnetic field, you can generate a current in a conductor. It's called induction. Uh, it's uh, an important feature of electrical generators, which basically rotate a coil of water, a wire inside an electromagnet or a permanent magnet. It's the same thing. The magnetic field changes as the wire moves around and you put a current into the wire. Um, the telegraph systems work this way. Uh, they have basically uh, a, a sender, which, uh, whose one end of it is grounded, and the other end goes into uh, a wire, uh, goes to a battery, and then ground, and then up into the key, and then through a wire, you know, 50 miles away to the receiver, uh, and then the other side of that receiver is also grounded. Now, for a long period of time, people thought that the way telegraph systems were upset by space weather and magnetic storms was, okay, the Earth's magnetic field wiggles around, you've got this long copper wire going 20 miles that gets current induced into the copper wire because the magnetic field of the Earth wiggles back and forth across the wire. It doesn't happen that way at all. That's, that's one of those, it's not an urban legend, but it's sort of a myth that, that sort of is based on sort of a common sense, but it really isn't the way it works. Instead, the reason that you have single wire telegraph systems is because the circuit, the electric circuit for the telegraph is completed through what's called the ground current. If you take two conductors, stick them into the ground, 
you can actually measure a current going on between these two conductors. And the telegraph systems use that to drive you know, the return current from, from the battery and the telegraph system. Now, how big is the ground current on the Earth? Well, ground currents are basically the sizes of continents. So if you have a weak magnetic field jiggling across a continent, that's going to induce a current, not in a little teeny copper wire, but in the actual ground current that's flowing across continents. And that's how it happens. These ground currents get amplified, and they flow up into the telegraph systems and blow out the telegraph systems. Because the telegraph system uses maybe 100 volts, and all of a sudden, you know, it's getting three or 4,000 volts of potential and a lot of amperage going. So that's sort of the mystery. And unfortunately, <clears throat> telegraphs were developed in the, in the 1840s and deployed very aggressively. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, very quickly, we got telegraph systems with lots of copper wire and lots of these, these sort of circuits all over the place. And so whenever we did have large solar storms, they were a perfect receiver uh, for these events. And so you have record after record of telegraph systems going down, you know, Wall Street and, and, and stock exchanges going down for, for a good portion of the day at a time. Lots of trades didn't happen and misinformation. So, you know, that's sort of that, that whole scene. Uh, there were also transatlantic cables that were laid. Um, and same principle. Uh, and they were just as suspected just as able to come down during a, a large storm uh, as the telegraph systems, because they were basically a copper wire that was also grounded <laughs> into the earth uh, at the opposite ends of the cable. Even though the cable was several thousand miles long, the ground current was still flowing and was still being upset uh, by these, the geomagnetic storms. So for a period of time, they, they really couldn't get around it. It was a real big technological problem, how you can defeat these magnetic storms and prevent them from messing up your telegraphy. Um, the 1859 superstorm was a particularly dramatic one. Uh, I won't go into a lot of the details, but uh, you know, it, it caused basically uh, two-thirds of Earth's telegraph systems to go down for, for a day or more at a time, which was just a massive trauma at the time. Uh, you read the newspapers uh, from the New York Times, uh, and other sources, and you get just these amazing stories of, of things that happened. Uh, telegraph systems that actually burst into flame. <laughs> uh, at that time, you know, the customer was, was so ignorant about electricity uh, that one could almost imagine that they thought the act of bursting into flame was a normal part of the telegraphic act, <laughs> you know. I mean, they didn't know what electricity was. The average person at that time, I mean, that was such a new concept, and when they saw you know, sparks and things <clears throat> flying off. You thought, oh, that must be a normal part. Well, you know, <laughs> they get charged an extra 10 bucks for, you know, the, the message or hazard pay. There's a dramatic story about a, a poor girl uh, who basically went completely bonkers and ran down Main Street and was uh, basically arrested by a, a sheriff and dragged off to uh, the local insane asylum because she thought that you know, the crimson red sky that she was seeing, you could read a newspaper by, was basically the end of the world, you know, and that, that's all there was to it. A lot of people at that time thought that this was it, because the skies were so crimson red and so bright that you could read newspaper by, by easily, uh, but everything had this red cast to it. Um, miners uh, at, uh, in, in Colorado, um, at Pikes Peak, uh, they, they woke up at like one in the morning and thought it was uh, broad daylight, you know, morning, so they started fixing their breakfast and getting their pack mules mounted and all that. Because they thought it was like, uh, you know, seven in the morning. So, you know, they didn't know. It's amazing, amazing time. Um, telegraph wires are useless for hours. Nature paints uh, the aurora. A, a lot of these uh, amazing stories. And now we're getting into like the 1900s, and you're still getting the same kind of stories. In the 1900s, you know, you're still getting telegraph is the issue because that was the technology. Uh, now you're starting to hear stories about uh, electrical systems actually coming down. Uh, in this particular case in, uh, in Switzerland, their uh, streetcar service went down for about a half a day, uh, also because of a magnetic storm event. Uh, so here, now the problem in the technology has moved 
from telegraph systems over into electrical systems in general, if the electrical systems are widespread enough and of a certain type. Um, you know, th this is all from the front page of the New York Times. This is how dramatic these events were. Every time there was one of these events, it would be on the front page of the New York Times. It, it just had basically this column space dedicated to this, this particular thing. You know, they didn't even question it because people were completely, they went completely bonkers with all the ways in which these uh, solar storms were affecting them. There, there was a sense that, oh, okay, they were related to aurora and sunspots, so the public was slowly beginning to understand there was a relationship between telegraph systems going down and maybe a solar flare or a particularly large auspicious sunspot. So that became part of the public view of things, uh, even by about this time. Um, then we have something new coming up as a communication technology. We have wireless technology, uh, first uh, operating at very low frequency and long wavelengths, uh, but then steadily by the 1920s moving up into short wave. Um, and that poses a whole other set of problems. Uh, wireless radio in 1915 and during the First World War was sort of the you know, the huge technological innovation where you could communicate by radio with uh, somebody thousands of miles away uh, through basically what, what it was, is it was a spark gap transmitter. Uh, they made a very uh, high current spark between two carbon uh, cylinder strokes. Uh, and basically that produced, every time the spark was there, it was a dot and every time it wasn't, it was a dash. And so you could do basically Morse code with just by turning off and on uh, the spark gap. And there was so much electrical energy put into this gap uh, that it produced really powerful long wavelength bursts of energy uh, that you could detect with uh, another similarly designed receiver on the other end. And, you know, really clever. And this was also roughly about the time that uh, Fleming and others developed uh, the first vacuum tube. Uh, so that was sort of used, especially the forest. Uh, that became part of sort of the electronics that, that souped up uh, wireless communication. Uh, and then, of course, sound communication happened very soon after that. But all the while, uh, during the, you know, the First World War, uh, you had interactions between space weather and the persecution of the war. Uh, in some instances, you would have the auroras so bright that they lit up uh, all of London so that the uh, bombers could do bomb bombing runs over uh, places in England and things like that. Um, so that became a real problem. Um, public radio started becoming a real uh, resource in uh, the early 1920s. Uh, after World War I, uh, radio was, was opened up. It was sort of suppressed during World War I uh, because even though the technology was, was easily available for amateurs to build, you know, on their kitchen table, quite literally, uh, they began to realize that amateurs were also starting to broadcast false information, <laughs> which was confusing the war effort. So basically the military uh, put the kibosh on, you know, public development of radio receivers and transmitters during the World War. But once the war was over, it instantly became a commercial success, and you had these assembly lines of people assembling the first uh, vacuum tube radios. Uh, you had the first uh, commercial transmitters installed in the United States on the East Coast first, and then in the West Coast. Uh, KDKA, I think, was the first station in New York, and followed by others. Uh, but still, you know, people would hear uh, from time to time that their reception was uh, really bad. And these were more often than not uh, attributed to space weather events of one kind or another. Um, and it became a real problem, a growing problem, especially as, as we moved into even higher frequency transmissions. Because uh, at that point, your ability to receive and transmit depends very critically on the state of the ionosphere uh, within your sort of local region. You're using it for bouncing the signal to distant uh, receivers. Um, and the ionosphere is one of the first things that gets really messed up uh, when you have very powerful bursts of x-rays coming off of these uh, space weather events. So, uh, pr pretty soon after the development of shortwave radio in the 1930s and its use during World War II, there was always side by side uh, this issue of, uh, you know, worrying about the next solar flare 
that would not only disrupt commercial broadcasts, which were essential not only for entertainment, but also for transmitting letters uh, to your relatives on the other continent or across the pond or whatever. Uh, shortwave became a really important ingredient to sort of the human community, just like social media is today, arguably. Uh, but the military also had real issues with it because the same shortwave mishaps that messed up commercial radio would also mess up important communications uh, between, you know, the, the military command and control system and what was going on actually on the ground uh, some, some distance away. Uh, orders would be, you know, hashed out into noise and uh, a lot of issues like that rose. So the military uh, became very interested in, in, in not only developing ways to mitigate these static conditions during the solar storms, but also to try to predict when the next one was going to happen. Uh, so that sort of started this whole idea of, of studying the sun as well as we could as a physical object to figure out when the next bad storm would happen. And it wasn't too long before people realized that these really big events happened when you had complicated sunspot magnetic fields trying to reorganize themselves into a lower, lower energy configuration. And especially if you had opposing fields being forced together, uh, you would wind up basically reconnecting those into a different kind of a field. And that reconnection event would release an enormous amount of energy that would heat the local plasma and emit X-rays. So they began to develop, you know, at national observatories, the ability to not only look at sunspots, you know, with uh, H-alpha filters and things like that, but they developed the Zeeman techniques for actually measuring magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. Not only just along the line of sight, but also transverse to the line of sight. So that was a whole new development in science that sort of came as the result of the military's need to be able to predict when the next interference would happen with uh, you know, their shortwave uh, communication systems. Um, and meanwhile, you know, there, there were Again, front page of the New York Times, even as late as the 1940s and the early 50s, there were an endless number of stories about how the last space weather event uh, messed up communications uh, and, and caused all kinds of things. <laughs> Here's one case in 1941, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers uh, versus Pittsburgh Pirates in the playoff games. Uh, the score was 0-0, uh, and then there was a roughly a, a 10 minute uh, basic static that went on, and then the announcer came uh, back on the line and said that uh, the Pirates got four runs. And, and basically the, the listeners were so irate with the radio going down during this crucial time that they bombarded the switchboard at the radio station saying, what the hell did you do? But it was the sun. They tried to say, no, it's the sun that did this. But, you know, the, the fans would have none of this. But it turned out to be true. Um, submarine was thought to be sunk. Uh, uh, turned out that it just didn't make its appointed uh, nine o'clock communication because there was too much radio static due to a solar flare event. Uh, finally, we get to, sort of to a bigger picture, and, and that is that um, you know if you look at how space weather events have been reported, you know going back through the newspapers, uh, you discover that the reportage was extremely high and active up until about 1950. And then roughly around 1950, there was a very sharp decline in reporting space weather events, like shortwave outages or power outages or what have you. Um, the plausible theory behind this is that this was also the time when TVs were becoming more common in the public. So the newspaper reportage was taking a nosedive while TV was becoming the ascendant way that people got their news. The problem is that space weather events don't follow the TV news cycle. It's very hard. You know, the TV news cycle is about what's happening right now and not about what happened last night. All right? That's what sells the program, that it's immediate news. Newspapers, they have a longer cycle, so they can actually keep up with the big space weather event and report it in the next morning's newspaper, and that's, that's not a problem. But if fewer subscribers are subscribing because they're all watching TV, then what the newspapers wind up doing is saying, well, we have to devote space weather to a much smaller number of column inches because we have to report on even more exciting things that are happening right now because that's the TV news cycle. So you see what happens here. 
Space weather events basically get crowded out. TV doesn't want to report it, newspapers don't want to report it, and so that's why your stories that you hear even today about space weather events, you hardly ever hear about, about a lot of them. Um, especially what's going on now is that, uh, you know, newspaper reporters are, are pretty hard pressed. They have all kinds of stories that arrive on their desk every day that they have to decide what to discuss and what not to discuss. Uh, and if people provide them with prepackaged material, uh, they basically take the prepackaged material and incorporate it into the story. And poof, you got an instant story. You didn't have to do a whole lot of research because the information came to you, you know, from some agency or some source. Uh, and so they tend to not report space weather events because to do that, you've actually got to go out into the field and find out what actually happened which means you've got to report on outages that actually happened or deaths that actually happened. And, and they don't associate that with part of that news cycle any longer. That's, that's sort of what they did in the New York Times, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but it's not the new school way of doing it. So consequently, the stories that we hear are just a shadow of what our grandparents or even parents heard, uh, who were far more literate about space weather events and what they could do than, than really we are today. But, you know, we shouldn't beat ourselves over, over the heads too much because what we have developed is technologies for communication that are far more robust than shortwave and longwave communication and telegraphy. Uh, we've moved into, you know, optical fibers. Uh, we have the internet, which is largely optical fiber dominated and therefore pretty immune to things. Uh, the only places where you have difficulties is if information has to come from a satellite bounce from somewhere else. And if that satellite is sort of the weak link, you know, then you can have an interruption in service temporarily. But satellite operators are extremely clever. Uh, when they license out their transponders to various customers to use, basically there's always a backup plan. If your transponder goes out because of a satellite malfunction, we'll immediately switch you over to one of our other satellites and you're, there'll be almost no interruption in your service. And that's what happens now. Um, so even if there is a big storm, you'll probably not hear about it in terms of communication interruptions because there are now so many backup ways of, of patching that over. Uh, the only remaining place where you're likely to hear about it is if uh, your, your electrical power goes out. That is one of the last places where we have yet to really make uh, our electric power grid technology as immune to space weather as it could be. We know how to do that. Uh, it's estimated to cost about two to three billion dollars uh, for us to harden our domestic power grid in the lower 48. Uh, and the utilities are sort of slowly warming up to that idea, but the question is, are they gonna complete their changes <laughs> before we have the next event? Uh, these really big Carrington events are on the order of every 100, 150 years. We're sort of overdue for that, just like California is overdue for the next major earthquake. So, you know, we're always playing this, this, this sort of race with, with the sun. Um, we're pretty far along in that race right now, so long as we only talk about technology. As soon as we start talking about humans operating in space, we're now talking about a whole other set of issues that basically still have not gone away. Um, space weather and the state of the sun is the single biggest factor that is challenging our going to Mars and having the astronauts wind up there in a healthy state. Um, the radiation exposure they'll get is uh, expected to be you know, pretty, pretty dramatic.